Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thanks for joining us again. And I'm continuing with my new segment where I interview other pet professionals about an assortment of topics, whether it's dog training, dog care, uh, dog nutrition, dog health, dog rescue, dog whatever. And today we have a repeat guest. Uh, I, I convinced him to come back on. I begged him, uh, Steve Sacatelli with the Animal Shelter Project. And um, you know, if I'll, I'll throw the video link up there to our previous interview and you can check out all about Steve because I kind of uh, give him a little preview in our last video. Uh, so today I want to jump right in. We're going to be talking about the no-kill movement in the animal rescue industry. And, uh, you know, we, we have a couple of, of bullet points and we'll kind of see where this conversation takes us. Maybe I'll play devil's advocate along the way to give Steve, you know, give him a little resistance here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, before we start, Steve, I think it's a good idea because people think when they hear no kill, uh, they don't always understand what the definition of no kill is. You want to start there and give, give uh, the viewers a, a brief rundown of what no kill means by definition? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, first of all, I just want to say that like, I'm kind of being a Nathan Winograd parrot here. It's, uh, none of this is my work or my original thought. You know, um, Nathan Winograd is an attorney who essentially started the no-kill movement. He was running shelters. He turned shelters all over the country into no-kill shelters um, in various demographics. So I just want to start off with that real quick because I don't want to take the credit for this man's lifetime of work. I'm just I'm spreading the work because I, it's very good work. And it's, yeah, he's been and that's a good point. I'll, I'll throw uh, Nathan's website down in the comments as well because his, his website does have a lot of really good information on there for anyone who's interested. You know, we're going to do our best to highlight some of the, you know, the, the bullet points, if you will, but his website's pretty in depth. So I'll make sure I throw that in the link below. Okay. But in answer to your question, I mean, technically no kill means that you don't kill any animals. And one of the important points about this movement and this work is that it draws a distinction between killing and euthanasia. And, you know, shelters all the time say, you know, this animal's been euthanized, but, you know, the definition of euthanasia is a mercy killing that is in the best interest of the animal being put down. The animal is suffering irremediably, cannot be helped, or, you know, even sometimes a, a severe aggression case where the animal will never be safely placed anywhere. And in those instances, you know, euthanasia is true to its definition. It is in the best interest of the animal is ending suffering. Um, but really 99% of what happens in shelters is killing animals for space. And it's not euthanasia. They're healthy animals that want to live. So when we talk about no kill, it's important to notice that that doesn't mean no euthanasia. Animals are still euthanized, properly euthanized when they're suffering, when they cannot be placed. And, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that's proportionately very few of the animals in the shelters. It's, it's probably less than five or four percent. Um, you know, another confusing thing that's come about is that there was sort of this benchmark. If you're saving 90% of your animals, I don't know if it was that you were considered a no-kill shelter or that you were well on your way or that it was very close, but I, no, I think 90% 90, 90 validates you as a no-kill shelter. Yeah, but... Not, not by me. I, mean, <laughs> I just... I mean, even Nathan has distinguished that. That's sort of a bench. That's sort of a benchmark. Like, because you're saving 90% of your animals, that is a place where you could be considered no kill. But if you're still killing animals for space and you're saving 90%, I mean, if a city shelter is taking in 100,000 animals a year, just to throw out an even number, and they're at 90%, you're still killing 10,000 animals a year. That's a lot of death. Well, at, so, right now, according to Nathan's no kill movement, though, he differentiates between killing and euthanasia, whereas right. A lot of organizations don't. Euthanasia is a dead dog. No, killing is a dead dog, and they don't differentiate. So that's a good point you bring up. But, you know, technically you're no kill when you're not killing any animals. And, you know, real, the real successful bona fide no kill shelters are seeing 98, 99% placement rates. So you can see how small the number of animals needing to be put down for their own benefit is. You know, um, but at ten, at ninety percent, that's a benchmark. Now he's calling it the ninety percent club. So he's not flat out saying that's no kill necessarily yet. It's still a very good result in the in the grand scheme of things and what's going on in the country. But it's not 
you're not done yet at 90%. So, you know, and it, it comes to be this problem because shelters that are getting 90% are calling themselves no kill and people are thinking that it's safe to drop their pets off there. And then they're learning that their animal was put down later and there was nothing wrong with this animal and they're, they're, they're feeling lied to or betrayed. And, you know, that's not Nathan's fault. That's a shelter not telling them, you know, well, your animal could still be put down. We're not, we're not at a place where we're not killing any animals for space. So, you know, part of this whole thing is transparency and it's very important because, you know, as we've seen this week with the coronavirus going through the country and shelters closing down and all these shelters are telling the public, we're going to have to shut down and we have no choice but to put all these animals down and people are rushing in droves to the shelters and fostering. And you see the news all across the country of, you know, shelters emptying because in a crisis, people are asked to help and they are, they're going. And, you know, it just goes to show how transparency works when you, when you say, Oh, everything's fine here. We're not killing any animals because you're worried about your donation dollars. You're killing animals by doing that. People are, okay, it's fine there. Let's move on. When you say, we're in a position here. We're going to have to start killing some animals if we don't get some help. People go and help a lot, of, most of the time. So transparency is a big part of the no-kill movement. You know, shelters, the successful ones, build a, a, a sort of following of loyal helpers, and they, you know, you see it all the time with some of them. You know, like we need a home for a litter of bottle feeding kittens by the end of today, or they will die you know, and somebody comes in, you know, when you're really honest with people, you really, you get a loyal following and, you know, there are many exceptions, of course, but, but transparency helps, helps a lot. Yeah. And, you know, I, I find the opposite is also true when it comes to like small rescues that take really good care of their animals and they're in loving foster homes and they show all these sweet lovey dovey pictures. They don't get a fraction of the publicity as the death row dog does, which I, I think is, it, it, you know, I mean, I get it, you know, people, they, it's most, a, a lot of people are run by their emotions, um, you know, but I, I, I think what people don't understand is, you know, if they adopt, adopt a dog like that, that rescue is just going to take another dog from the shelter and save that one. So, right. you know, that, that's kind of how I try to tell people, but those, you know, those uh, Sarah McLaughlin commercials really, really tug at heartstrings. <laughs> Yeah, don't get me started on the ASPCA. That's a whole other. Yeah, well, you know what I mean, though. I mean, what you're talking about is a legitimate paradox, and I think it's largely the emotions you say, but it's also the sense of urgency. Like this dog's going to be put down in the morning. I better go help that dog now. And it, it is smart for rescues to say, you know, you are saving a dog when you, even though this dog is safe and we are a no-kill rescue, you're saving a dog. You're not saving the dog that you're adopting. You're saving the next one you pull. Your dog was saved by the person that adopted from us last. So you know what? You're saving an animal. You're doing the same good by adopting from a rescue. And you're helping us to avoid, you know, sometimes these poor rescues that get stuck warehousing these dogs for months and months and months and sometimes years because it's not urgent. You know, and if, like, further to your point, if people were to make that point, you were saving, there's another one that's going to be put down in the morning. We're going to go grab him when you adopt this one. So you're, you're doing just as much good here. You know, it's important. So, yeah. So, so how, I mean, I, I know that, you know, you're, you're um, promoting a movement and some theories, you know, that Nathan has had success in, in implementing in some shelters. Um, what are some of the first steps of, of achieving this no kill effort? Okay. Well, there are 11 elements to the no kill. He calls it the no kill equation. And if you, if you use all these 11 elements, you're going to succeed. And they are, you see if I, I have them written down in my outline, I'll cheat in a minute, but they're um, a compassionate director, um, an aggressive adoption program, volunteers, a foster network, return to owner programs, trap neuter return for cats. Oh, you're back. Okay, so uh, we, we were just talking about the 11 steps. I'll run through them real quick. Um, I'll reiterate them again. We, we had a little bit of technical difficulty, so I'm going to run down this list on Steve's behalf. Uh, this is, this is from Nathan's page, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same. Uh, so, okay, um, the, the 11, the, the equations are 11 steps to, to move towards a no kill shelter or organization, uh, having rescue partnerships, volunteers, foster care, trap neuter release for cats, 
pet retention, keeping animals in their home, comprehensive adoption programs, public relations and community involvement, medical and behavior prevention and rehabilitation, high volume, low cost spay and neuter, proactive redemptions, and hardworking, compassionate shelter director. So those are the 11, 11 tidbits. So, tidbits. So um, steps, tidbits, whatever. I, I like, and I'm, you know, as a rescue person, I see dollar signs, a lot of dollar signs here. Like this costs a lot of money. That's what I see. Okay. Well, and maybe I'm playing devil's advocate. Like I said, I promised I would. Uh. <laughs> well, can we, can we table the cost thing for just a second? Cause I think there's an over, um, there's an enveloping point to be made before sure, we yeah. get into any yeah. And that is that what people don't realize is that there's not a pet overpopulation in this country. There used to be. In the 70s, we were putting down 20, 30 million animals a year in shelters, and people were, by and large, not staying and neutering to the degree that they are. Today, we are putting down about 3 million animals in shelters in the whole country. That's how many are dying. And Meaning at the same dogs time, and cats? Mostly dogs and cats, also guinea pigs, rabbits, birds, a little, you know, some of the right. fringe pets, I guess. And it's but only uh, 3 million? I thought it was up around four and a half. Um, a couple of years ago, it was four. It's, we've made a lot of progress in like the last five years. It's down to, by some estimates, it's even like 2.8. Like we're getting there. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can't quote these numbers exactly. It's very fluid. Yeah, I know. There's so many different or there's so many different sources too. And we have good years. We have bad years. It, it goes up and down. Yeah. But approximately, we're putting down three million animals, shelter animals, a year now. Right. And approximately. 29 million homes in the United States are getting a new pet every year. So, and that's from all sources, some from the shelter, some from rescue groups, some they find on the street, from friends and families, from breeders. So if there are 10 times the number of homes getting a pet each year than the number we're putting down, what this is really is a marketing failure. We're failing to compete with other sources, you know, and for every animal put down in the shelter, there are potentially 10 homes available. And people, you know, that don't like to believe this always say, oh, but they may not be good homes. I'm like, come on, you can't find one home that's better than death of 10, you know, for each animal. Well, just, how, about, how, about, how about an inner city shelter that's 80% pit bulls? You're going to find one out of 10 it's, homes that wants a pit bull from an inner city shelter? Yes. Nathan's program has worked in city shelters, in rural shelters, in high income areas, in low income areas, in high per capita um, shelter population, low per capita, all sorts of demographics. It works. And part of this is outreach to the community. And, you know, one of the groups that I love is, is the group that I always talk about in Newark, um, Forgotten Tales and and all those volunteers at the Newark shelter where I got my last dog, Peanut. They do such a great job of marketing those dogs. They have, they're almost always all pit bulls. Mm -hmm. They never mention it. They're just showing these beautiful dogs and they're so friendly and they're, they're so smart about how they handle them and they keep them double leashed at the adoption events. And, you know, they let them introduce to other dogs, but they, they seem to know, like if the dogs are nose to nose for too long, you pull them apart. That's not a situation you want dogs that don't know each other. And they're, they're so smart about how they handle everything. And they market these pit bulls and they never say that they never bring up they're just beautiful animals they talk about their personalities and whether they're good with other dogs or not and their age and their size and what what things they love you know you almost forget that they're all pit bulls and you know 40 percent of the dogs in the country are some sort of pit bull it's the most <laughs> popular breed you know i mean it's not even a breed as you know but just to be you know to, to simplify things a little bit it, no, I, I, I promote them as a specific breed. Oh, it look, looks like we had technical difficulty again. Oh, there's Steve. He's back. It's my phone. That's it's okay. my phone. So, um, I, yeah, I, I actually acknowledge the pit bull as an individual breed. The fact that when, that's fair. when but when people say it's not a breed, I, I'm already getting emotional because that pisses me off because the American Pitbull Terrier is a breed and it's one of yeah. 
10 breeds that is caused for bite issues in the country that they're not guilty of. So anyway, which I'll, I'll throw up there to my pit bull myths video. If anyone wants to check that out, I don't want to, I know me and Steve, we can go off on a tangent, um, <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll try to focus back on the no kill move. So, all right. So an inner city shelter, like, you know, like the one up North where, you know, you have a, a core group of a, a few different rescues that are doing their part. Um, but I, I mean, how, how do we bridge that gap from that to the inner city run shelter by bureaucrats? Well, really I mean, one, of the part, one of the parts of the equation and one of the most important parts is a compassionate, hardworking director. If you don't have that, you know, you don't have anything really. I mean, you're right. There are directors at New York City, nine million people in a square mile. You can't place ten thousand dogs a year. That's what you're putting down, twenty thousand. That's a lack of effort. Yeah, and I was looking at you know your little chart that you sent me, um, and you know like that's Nathan's chart. <laughs> yeah, Nathan's chart, and the the compassionate director is last. And I don't know if he does that on purpose, but I'm thinking it should be up here, number one. Because shit rolls downhill. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's important with that. If you have a person leading the organization that doesn't care, they're not going to implement the other things. Exactly. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, what a, I mean, to me, to me, one of the most important things is pet retention because, you know, we were just talking about the numbers of how many animals are put down and how many homes are getting a new pet. And it's, it's feasible. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's feasible that we, we're a no kill country right now because there are enough homes and the pet retention element ties directly to one of the things that you hear shelter directors say all the time and that is we have to take every animal that comes in here we have no choice we signed a contract with the city to do animal control and every person that comes in here without any notice to dump their responsibilities on us in a split second we have to take that animal we have no choice and that's not entirely true you know Part of what you have to do is slow the intake a little bit. And yeah, you signed the contract, you have to take them, but I don't think any of these contracts, and I've seen lots of contracts and they're all worded a little bit differently, but you don't have to take them on the spot. Okay, come in, we're gonna have a little counseling session and we're gonna make an appointment for a week for you to come in with the dog's records and do a behavioral analysis. And then you're gonna make an appointment for surrender after that. You know, or how many people we take, you know, surrendering those pets are doing so because they're out of work and they can't afford to feed him for a few months. How about if we donate four months of dog food? That's going to be cheaper than us housing the dog, cleaning up after the, after the dog and euthanizing the dog. You know, I can't afford the surgery that he needs to stay alive. Well, we have a vet on premises. How about if we put you on a no interest payment plan for $10 a month and we do the surgery and you take the dog home? I mean, those are maybe oversimplified examples, but how much can you well, do? They're also, those... very, they're also very idealistic and not many municipal shelters are run that way. I mean, but, it, they have someone walking in with an animal to surrender. And if that's one of the services that the municipality provides to its citizens, they do have to take the dog in on the spot. Have you seen a lot of these contracts? They're not all worded that tightly. I don't and you know, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about animal control contracts. I'm talking about municipal statutes that people pay taxes for services. That's not a contract. Those are municipal well, services. What the services that we're guaranteed as citizens are that dangerous animals and strays are not running the streets. Animal control services. We're not guaranteed that we can just dump our own pets on the shelter at any given moment in time. They that's how they're operating. You're correct. That's how most of them are operating, like this sort of receptacle. Of no, my, my point being is, is that that municipal statutes are separate from people who enter contracts with animal control facilities. That's my point. That's all. I don't understand. You're like people entering contracts. Okay. So you have a municipal shelter. Let's say, um, I don't know, Bloomfield, because that's where I'm from. And this is, this is a hypothetical so there's a public shelter in the town I used to live in up in New Jersey. You know, people from the township, that would be the shelter that services them. But the neighboring couple of towns over, West Orange, they got rid of their animal control services 
and facility, and they contracted with the township of Bloomfield to provide animal care and control for that township. So you have the municipal shelter in Bloomfield who, who provides those services to its town, to its residents, and then you have a contract where the township of Bloomfield is making revenue off of another township. Two separate things entirely. That's what I meant. Okay, there's also, we should also draw another distinction because when animal control brings a stray animal into the shelter, they are absolutely required to take that animal right then and there. That's true. Mm -hmm. When Joe Snow down the street decides he doesn't want his dog anymore and he's gonna go bring them, bring them to the pound today, and nobody can foresee that or you know predict those numbers or that volume, it's questionable as to whether they have to take that dog right now. And even if the contract is worded that way, my point is how many of these people would prefer another option? We don't know, but some. Some. You know, part, the, the thing about this is that not, no one part of this equation does everything on its own. It's about chipping away at the intake where you can, chipping away at the euthanasia where you can, incrementally increasing the adoptions and the foster placements a step at a time. You know, like everything is doing a little bit of the whole. Yeah, and it's, so, it's, very, it's very holistic when you look at this. And again, I'll, I'll throw the link down below so people can go to Nathan's site and check it out. I mean, it is very holistic. And I think we're, and at least just what I've heard in the course of my rescue career is, you know, a shelter or a facility might be at 50, 60 percent. And 90 percent, and I use that figure loosely because we talked about that earlier, but for argument's sake, let's say 90 percent is our target. Like 50% and 90% is insurmountable, but 50 to 55% isn't. And I think uh, as, you, as you were just alluding to, that incremental chipping away at those numbers is how I think people get there, yeah? Yes, but also, and I don't think this is contradictory to that, but also surprisingly, the shelter directors that are knowledgeable and motivated and compassionate that come in very often reach no kill in the first year. It happens very quickly because when you start reaching out to the public and saying, you know, nobody told you this because it hurts their donation dollars, but under the last director, they were killing 60%, they're killing 8,000 animals a year in here. And you don't, all you see is the nice commercial, Sarah mm -hmm. McLaughlin. <laughs> they don't, you don't see what goes on. When the new director comes in and says, we're killing 8,000 animals a year, we need help to stop this. I know you don't want this to happen with your tax dollars. People step up. You've seen it with this coronavirus thing. Shelters all across the country are emptying. I mean, like companion people, with many exceptions, people in this country generally care about companion animals. And like, that's another part of Nathan's research. He's shown that like, even during severe recessions, the part of the economy that doesn't hurt is, is pet toys and food and clothing. People really love their pets. You know, when we're in rescue and we work in shelters and things, all we see is the bad side. We see the abuse and the surrenders, but it's really a small part. It's, a, you know, we get myopic and we, we see a small part. And anecdotally, it se seems like it's everything, but it's not. It's a very small proportion when you look at the numbers. Yeah. I mean, and me being a trainer, I get to see the opposite side of it where I, they wind up hiring me because they love their animal too much and the friggin' animal's getting away with murder and running the house. <laughs> <laughs> which isn't a, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, um, you know, what? let's, I, you know, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to run out of time, but I, I think if you want, and this just popped into my head, let's, cause I'm done being devil's advocate cause I support no kill. So <laughs> I don't make, uh, that's not the kind well, of hope that you do that. It's, it's good that you do that because people don't believe it's possible. I know. I just like, I hate doing that because I support this endeavor, you know, but you know, I got to try to make for good TV. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, let, let's, let's run down. We talked about having a compassion shelter director. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll blurb these out and then you and I will throw a couple of tidbits, right. About how this could be. And I, I don't know Nathan's website. I, I met him maybe, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago in Manhattan. He did, uh, it was during, uh, it was uh, uh, what you call it. Uh, what do you what do you call it when a movie is launched? Um, Premiere. Thank you. 
Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I went to a premiere of his no-kill advocacy thing many years ago in Manhattan. Um, but I, I don't I don't know the details of this like like Steve knows it. So I'll mention some tidbits, but then you can you can go on. So rescue partnerships to when I hear that, I hear if they have certain dogs that might be hard to place in their community or or maybe they have a breed specific uh, rescue that they partner with, that rescue can come in and get that dog into a better environment and free up more space for the shelter to operate. But even more comprehensively, like active involvement with res many rescue partners, you know, um, and, and friendly relationships. Like you'd be surprised a lot of the shelters have adversarial relationships with rescue groups. And, and the number of times I've experienced the shelter director putting an animal down to spite someone they don't like, you know, this happened to me before. You know, and it's awful, you know, and not every shelter, that's, that's rare, but it happens. Um, more comprehensive than what you're saying, a lot of active relationships, you know, showing them the animals as they come in just so that they can start planning, okay, if we place two at our adoption event, this weekend, maybe we'll go get that one and this one. And, you know, breed specific rescues are so important. Like, you know, if you're running a shelter and you get like a red Doberman in, that's a beautiful rare dog that a lot of people want. You call up a Doberman rescue, get that dog out of here. That just buys the little black pit bull that doesn't get any attention. That buys him another week. Just rip that space. You get a Laza Opsu. A lot of shelters do this thing where they want to hold on to the pretty dog so that their sort of catalog of what they're offering is more diverse and more beautiful. And it's nonsense. Get them out, you know? You know, if you have a good relationship with rescues, you might be able to say, okay, we gave you the red Doberman, that Laza Opsu, that Yorkie. Can you take these two black pit bulls for us too this time? And they're going to say, of course, you know, if you have the right relationship. But you yeah. get them out, you know, get them out of the shelter. Yep. Um, all right, so next is volunteers. Obviously, when I hear volunteers, all the stuff you were talking about, not just with rescues, but people who volunteer at shelters are also marketing agents for the dogs, right? And, and yeah, the care and training and handling and cleaning and feeding, all that stuff comes into play. Um, you know, but I, I think, uh, and the socializing, obviously, all that stuff is what I think of when I hear volunteering. Is that kind of what, what goes into his thoughts? Yeah, and again, like friendly relationships, a lot of shelters have very adversarial relationships with volunteers, especially when they're killing animals and the volunteers are usually, they're there working for free because they love animals and they are rightfully very upset when they see this happen and they come back and their favorite dog's been put down. And you know, they have something to say about it sometimes. And that is always the start of something bad. And not that they shouldn't say anything. It's just that shelters don't react well to it. And part of this thing is that it is your constitutional right under section 1983 to volunteer for the animal shelter. They cannot kick you out. It's illegal. Um, it's and it happens section all the time. And uh, you can sue. And it's held up in court. People have sued under section 1983, win all the time. So, you know, for volunteers that have been kicked out of a shelter and, and you, you want to be there to help animals, you don't think they're being treated right, find a lawyer that'll do some pro bono work because they can't do that to you. It's illegal. If you're behaving appropriately. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's some <laughs> point at which you cross the line. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, I don't want a bunch of animal abusers running to volunteer at shelters. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure there are certain things that are for cause terminations. <laughs> that I, I would give. Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> no, that's a legitimate point. I mean, you can't go stabbing, you can't go stabbing people and expect to be allowed in. Under yeah, you, 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 you can't have like, you know, pedophiles going to allowed. speak at daycare facilities. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so foster care, I, I, you know, along the same lines as volunteering. Um, yeah, I mean, people don't, I mean, foster homes, I mean, God, we need more of them. We need so, we, we really do. I mean, I think they're great for, especially for people who, like when someone says, I've been thinking about getting a dog, I just don't know if I'm ready yet. The first thing I do is try to pitch them on being a foster home. Right. Because that, one. that temporary mindset, you know, I try to get them hook, line, and sink. And then I explain to them, look, temporary could be six months. <laughs> Right. But, the number uh, of times to me that's like, I don't want a pet. I'm not ready for a pet. Don't straddle me with this pet. And three weeks later, you're like, okay, I got someone to come and look at the dog next week. And they're like, 
you're not taking my dog. <laughs> they're attached, you know, it happens a lot of times. Right, right. Um, yeah, so obviously that's, that's self-explanatory. And I mean, you know, I, I know, uh, and for anyone watching, some municipal shelters, uh, they usually have uh, a, or public shelters, they usually have a nonprofit group associated with them that can help facilitate a lot of administrative stuff and fundraising, uh, obviously because with nonprofit 501c3 rescues, partnering with a shelter, because the shelter can't take tax deductible donations. They can accept money, you just can't write it off because it's a public shelter. Um, but you know, usually they, again, you have those, they call them the, 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 uh, the nonprofit arm of the shelter sometimes. Uh, and a lot of times their names are actually associated, like, Friends of Bloomfield Animal Shelter, Friends of Wayne Animal Shelter. Uh, there, you know, that, there's usually a volunteer organization that supports the municipal shelter in their community. Uh, so they usually have foster programs and financial support for foster uh, foster parents and things along those lines. But a lot of times, 501c3 nonprofit corporations are animal control. They get the contracts, like yeah. Um, you know, in New Orleans, our animal control is a 501c3 charity and they have the contract. So it can be, it can be structured a lot of different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then there's, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot of 501c3s that actually are contracted by townships, you know, across the country. So, mm. uh, all right. Trap, neuter, release. That's, that's more of a cat thing. <laughs> um, I, I guess TNR programs are, you know, the, I guess they could be city run. a lot of cats. Yeah, I mean the trap. I mean they're literally trapping them, That's getting the them fully medical, and you know, obviously getting them fixed for sure. Right, and ear tipping them and putting them back. I mean, basically, the research has shown that like feral cats, especially in a managed colony, don't have such bad lives. Like, why are we killing them? Get them off the streets for a minute to alter them so they're not breeding and increasing the population. You know. Um, sometimes we take the ones that are FIV positive and we get them off the streets. Sometimes people put them down because they don't want to transmit it. Um, if you want leukemia, sometimes they put those ones down because it's, it's an unpleasant death on the street. Um, but for the most part, they're returned to the colony and they live decent lives, you know? Um, yeah, and, and this, is one, is when, this is one of the we, things I get kind of caught up on, uh, from not from a rescue standpoint or anything like that but you know when you have a feral colony by definition they're wild animals right we animal control doesn't go around catching rats and bringing them to the shelter to rehome um you know and so that's it, it granted domestic cats or domestic cats but feral colonies they're they really are wild animals so that is that something where a, a, a focused fundraising effort or a specific group needs to cater to that? Or I have found that there are groups that do just that. You know, like in Jersey City, you, you and I both know Carol McNichol. She yep. does a lot of, she's a little rescue, she's a rescue group. Her, her group is called Companion Animal Trust, but she also does a lot of TNR and teaches other people how to do it and raises money for it. And a lot of veterinarians give good discounts for that, you know, and it's, it's very humane. And like you said, it's for, it's for wild animals, for cats that are wild. It's supposed to be, although sometimes domestic or domesticatable cats are out there. Um, but you know, it's, it's almost necessary because when you're just picking up cats and, and taking them away and putting them down, there's a vacuum effect. Other cats, other feral cats are just going to come into that spot where they were hanging out because they were there because there was a food source. Right. Or a shelter source. Yeah. So when you manage a colony and you have them altered, you've got no spraying, no fighting, and you've got no influx because other colonies are not going to try and infiltrate. You know, cats are, it's like lions, you know? What, what, about, what about nature just taking its course? They breed way too quickly for that to be effective. You know, right, they, but if you if you eliminate people and food, you create a more natural, um, strong will survive type of situation. 
But then people I know, and I, I mean, I love cats. I can't do this. What's that? Then, you know, then they're killing the songbirds for food. And, you know, they, they kill the rats and the mice, and we like that. But as soon as they kill a cardinal, everybody's upset. So, but they do know, that anyway, whether there's a big bag of food dumped in a driveway or not. I think when it's a managed colony and they're fed, and I'm not a cat expert by any stretch, but I'm, I'm just postulating. I think when they're, I think they hunt less when they're fed. I know I do. I, I would imagine, but they're, I mean, they're, there's, you're also providing food for other wild animals and bringing up other public health, public safety risks, which is why so many TNR programs get shit from, from local residents in that community because they're, yeah, they, they yeah. think, they think they're, they're feeding these eight cats, but that those eight cats turn into 28 very quickly. Well, that's why they're altered. They're well. No, are you talking about just other cats joining them? Yeah. Well, um, okay. We're gonna have to wrap this up because my phone's about to die. But um, okay. Research has shown that really, there's this vacuum effect, and you should have Carol on to talk about TNR because she knows more about this. I'm just I'm just but, playing devil's advocate a little bit. So. No, it doesn't really happen. A colony, a colony doesn't allow infiltrators that much. When they're altered and they're fed, it's infiltrators are rare. You're not they're killing any rats that come in to to steal food they left over, you know? And if you've had cats, you know that they don't have to be hungry to kill a mouse. They see a mouse, they fuck with them. sorry. <laughs> I agree. You're on YouTube. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean I yeah, and I know your phone's dying, but you know, I mean I've seen I've seen colonies where the raccoons and cats are eating together. And you know, we're I mean, very selective, aren't we? Like, what's what's a rodent and what's a pleasant animal? You know, it's like rats. Nobody likes rats, but raccoons. Some people don't mind raccoons. Possums, they eat ticks. I don't know. This yeah. is a complicated conversation. I know. I, we, we see. I told. I, I warned everyone earlier that me and Steve could get sidetracked. So, <laughs> how how much juice you got left in your phone? What's that? How much juice you have left in your phone? I'm at nine percent, and it's plugged in, but it doesn't seem to be helping. All right, let's let's right, we'll, we'll get it. We'll get in what we can, and and then we'll all right. So, um, trap litter release, which we spent way too much time on that, but it was interesting anyway. So, and for anyone interested, if you love cats and you do want to get involved in that kind of stuff, check out your local community. You 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 could you could find a TNR program where you can get involved, and in, you know, obviously me and Steve were doing some banter, but that's just for the purpose of you know YouTube, but. Uh, it it is really helpful to the community. It does help with with population control. So, uh, all right. So pet retention, obviously, keeping pets in homes is the primary objective there through education, financial support, training, all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, and I just want to keep emphasizing this, that has a lot to do with managing your inflow. I mean, managing your inflow has a lot. To, they're very interrelated. From from right. the way I see it, you know. Yeah, and I mean, slowing down your inflow is. Yeah, and I just want to make one point too: is that, for, and we talked about it earlier. You know, people hear "no kill shelter" and they think that their animal is going to be fine. And for anyone watching, um, as great as a shelter is, um, you know, a public shelter that is, you know, their primary purpose is to provide food water, shelter, safe environment for the animals, is still very stressful. Um, so if, if you guys, if someone out there is on the fence about getting rid of your animal, reach out to someone for help first, because there are, there are alternatives. There may be some solutions that you didn't even think of. So before you even consider something like that, do some little bit of research on your own. So, um, and people okay. forget, you're right, because animals are, are devastated when you give them up. They're your, their family, whether you love them or not, they love you. Yeah. And, like you said, the best shelters are not like, the best alternative. Yeah. Um, public relations, community involvement. We talked about that briefly, but, uh, you know, you want to talk about that real quick? Yeah, I mean, public involvement, I think, you know, the important things about that are transparency and asking for help, you know, having a good, you know, educating the public informing the public and asking for help from the public, you know, adoption events, getting local businesses to support adoption events, things like that. Right. 
Yeah, and even just like we were talking about, like transparency and the realities. We are full, and we got 25 dogs coming in. We need some foster homes, or we're going to end up putting some animals down. That kind of transparency, that kind right. of relationship and communication. Okay. People step up, and it's important to let people know when you're in a crisis. Yeah, yeah. Um, medical and behavior prevention and rehabilitation. You, you touched on it earlier, Steve. Some people, you know, they'll surrender their animal dogs, for instance, for you know whether it's a behavioral problem or a medical issue they can't they can't uh, afford. Um, a lot of times there there's help out there. Just ask for it. A lot of a lot of shelters and rescue organizations usually have dog trainers, for instance, that will offer discounts for rescue situations. So and then you have you know I mean I, I do discounts. Um, but it's also my primary revenue. Steve is a right. Steve does provides free dog training in his community, so there's a, you know there's, it's out there. So um, high volume. And the other part of that is that well, okay. I, I was just going to say the other, the other part of that is when you have animals in the shelter that have been surrounded and they're exhibiting behavioral issues. The part of this program is that you. You work with them, you see if you can modify that behavior before you just put them down. A lot of times animals are being put down because they're snarling in their cage and showing their teeth. And sometimes it's fear, you know, sometimes it's resolvable. Sometimes it's not, but sometimes it is. Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, we, we've talked about this many times. Growling is just a form of communication, but in a shelter with uh, uneducated people running the business part of it, growling is aggressive and it's not technically steve and i have been growling at each other for about 25 minutes now right we're just communicating that's all we're doing right now the intent behind our communication you know there's obviously that's where body language and stuff like that comes in but you're right it's it's you know a lot of times we need um more accurate assessment and identification of actual behavior so all right um <clears throat> High volume, low cost spay and neuter. Uh, you know, I, I, I mean, just for, for strict population control, spay and neuter. I mean, it's a no brainer. It, it's always a tough topic for me, just because I, I'm a holistic pet care practitioner too, and pediatric spaying and neutering goes against everything in my knowledge base from a health standpoint. Um, you know, but from a population control, it makes perfect sense. And my rescue hat, we want to spay and neuter them all, <laughs> you know, um, but it's, it's important sure, when, I mean, when we're talking about no kill. So, yeah, I mean, really what I'd like to do is keep my male's dog intact, intact, my male dogs intact until they're two, you know, but I don't ever release a dog for adoption unaltered because you just, God, you know, how many yeah. litters do you want to create accidentally? You can't, it's, it, yeah. it's hard. I mean, it's not going to kill them, but it is healthier to keep them intact a little while and let them grow up. And, you know, those, those hormones are there for a reason, but sometimes you act on the greater good and with a slight detriment to an individual animal. Well, yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> that's why I had prefaced with my holistic pet care hat on, I think that way, but from a no kill standpoint and, um, the pet population problem, we'll call it, or the homeless pet population problem. I don't want to call it overpopulation. The homeless pet population problem we have. What's that? Because it's not. <laughs> um, so, you know, from, from that standpoint, it's, it's a crucial component to, to helping shelters achieve something like this. Um, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I mean, I know people who they, you know, obviously I'm a dog trainer, so I don't only deal with rescue people. I deal with intact animals all the time, uh, you know, but they're pets. They're not letting their animals run free. They're not, you know, having, oh, it was an accidental litter, you know, that kind of stuff, um, you know, and which, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. If, if people are responsible and, then, you know, they're not, you know, doing any, and we're never going to be talking about breeders on this segment because it's a whole different topic of conversation and doesn't really align with the shelter and no kill issue. So, um, proactive redemp redemptions. What do you mean by that? When you get strays in actively, you know, 
advertise whose dog is this social media some you know shelters have segments on the local news or put ads in the paper really look for their owners let everybody know they're there just even advertise the fact that this is where strays come if you're missing your dog you know sometimes the good shelters people come in and they can't afford the redemption money to get their dog back there's a fine there's a hundred dollar fine forgive the fine give the people their dog back what are you, you kill this dog because somebody can't afford a hundred dollars you know that's what you're doing so you know nathan has stories about this too where somebody came in and he said you know pay what you can toward the fine and the lady came in and she had 37 cents so he took it and gave her her cat you know what were you going to do with this cat take it away from a woman that loves it and put it down or give it to someone else like give the lady her cat back if it's somebody who whose dogs are always running loose and it's happened 30 times and they just aren't taking care of their animal that's maybe a different story but sometimes people lose a dog once right. it happened to me last year years ago you know dogs dug out under the fence i didn't foresee it and you know they gave me a really hard time about it 300 dollars fine and they wouldn't give them back to me without a home inspection they held them on on to them for five days they were nasty about it mm. and it had never happened before it's not like i was a serial offender you know proactive redemptions means getting people their animals back you know yeah and it, it, that kind of baffles me sometimes i understand you know uh surrender fees or you know redemption fees because animal control had to provide the service of catching your your stray running running at large animal but at the same time if it, you know accidents happen for sure you know i mean we've all had even the with responsible people have a five-year-old that left the gate open you know things happen sometimes you know I, mean, I used to judge people that lost their animals all the time until it happened to me. And I was like, my dogs shoot through a locked door, went out in the yard and dug under a fence. Like, they weren't roaming free. They were in a <laughs> yeah. locked house while I was <laughs> like, You know, who could have seen that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard stories. I mean, it sounds silly, but hinges on, on doors get loose. Uh, doorknobs loosen up. Wood swells. Doors left open. Doors don't close properly. Shit happens. But... When that happens, it's usually a one-off with responsible people where, you know, you're not going to have the same mistake twice. Not usually. And yeah. like even responsible people get busy, stressed out, have a hard time in life and make a yeah. stupid mistake. Right. You sure. know, smart people can make one stupid, stupid mistake. You shouldn't hold it against them. No, yeah, yeah. No, I get Unless, it. So. Like I said, it's yeah, habitual offenders, then you might be having a different conversation. So. Anyway, I know we're running, we, we kind of ran a little over today, but I just want to see if there was anything else on here. Um, yeah, I think we covered pretty much everything that we want to take a, take a peek at. Um, and, you know, like I said, well, like Steve mentioned, he talked about Nathan Winograd's uh, information and, not, uh, you know, we'll make sure that we supply his link because, uh, you know, it really is a, a, a noble endeavor and very, very attainable. Uh, even for the most resource limited organization, uh, especially because, you know, again, all these things, these 11 components, you know, that it's holistic. You, you work and you implement them all together. And uh, I think it's great. And you have any lasting tidbits you want to offer my viewers, Steve? Adopt, don't shop. <laughs> Adopt, don't shop. And we shall leave it there. And uh, if this is your first time here on my channel, take a peek around. If you like what you see and you want to stay up to date on dog training, dog care, dog health, dog nutrition, dog rescue, dog whatever, consider subscribing. Click that bell so you get notified when I upload new content. And I'll see you guys soon.